Hello, I'm Peter Sharoshi, and you are watching Drug Reporter Cafe, Drug Reporter's regular online video series where we discuss international drug policy developments. Last time we talked about drug policy reform in Iceland. Today we will speak about cannabis reform in another island, Malta. I, I have two guest speakers with me here today, uh, Cyrus Engererer, uh, a member of the European Parliament, and Andrew Bonello from Relief, a cannabis reform uh, NGO from based in Malta. Thank you very much for uh, accepting my invitation and being being here with me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Peter. So, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, Malta is an island. So, as such, how is the drug situation different in Malta than in mainland Europe? So, how how what are the trends of cannabis use lately in Malta? Do people grow the, the plant in the island or is it is it uh, imported from, from the continents, Africa and Europe? How, how is it going? Well, um, in, in Malta, cannabis uh, has been used obviously for a very long time. Um, ma mainly uh, the main bulk of it, it was imported from, from North Africa and that would be hashish. Um, so that's that's all you would be able to find really um, up until sort of let's say the 2000s, you know. Um, and then people started to to grow over here um, locally, um, and of course, but the main bulk started to come in from from Europe, as in flour. So uh, flour has been constant for the past let's say 10, 15 years, and that's that's mainly the main product at the moment. You know, Malta for a long time has the reputation of a socially conservative country with uh, repressive drug laws. So Cyrus, how and when this uh, situation has started to change? Uh, yes, uh, Malta is known as a conservative country. However, things have changed over the past uh, eight years where we have had a new government, which was uh, very liberal with regards to social aspects. And we have seen uh, conservative Malta become um, a hero when it comes to a number of civil and human rights and liberties. And it is in this line of thought that the government in the past uh, few months uh, has decided to start and open up a consultation, a public consultation with regards to the decriminalization of cannabis use uh, in Malta. It, the consultation ended a couple of weeks ago and uh, the good thing is that we have seen a very interesting debate going on. So apart from the actual consultation process, there was a media debate, there were, there were a number of discussions held um, on the island and it, the interesting part was that the Labour Party, which is also the party in government and which I form uh, part of, has went has gone the, the extra mile, basically. So uh, within the consultation process on decriminalization, we are saying that there should not only be decriminalization, but also move on towards uh, legalization. As a member of the European Parliament, I have submitted my um, proposals to government on this. I, too, uh, believe that there should be legalization and not simply uh, decriminalization and one of the main aspects that I have spoken about and that the government seems to be or at least the part in government seems to be discussing quite a lot is the issue of uh, cannabis social clubs or as I call them cannabis social enterprises which are uh, as you know uh, very important for those who are not able to grow their own product especially uh, let's remember that till today it is illegal to grow uh, your own plant, uh, cannabis plant in, in Malta. Uh, and with the uh, reform that we are seeing, there will be a concession for people to grow their own plants. But we're going a step further because we believe that although it is important to allow people to grow their plant, we should also think of those who cannot grow their own plant. So uh, the idea of a community um, space for people to come together and pull together their resources uh, is something that I really believe in. Uh, you mentioned that it's illegal currently to grow cannabis in, in, in Malta. So what are the sanctions against uh, against drug users and then those people who, who cultivate cannabis for personal use? Well, unfortunately, well, back in 2015, we had um, uh, some, some sort of reform uh, which was a sort of depenalization uh, of, of growing one plant. 
So if you were caught growing one plant, then you were sort of channeled into a, a different system where um, there would be no minimum mandatory jail sentence, which is, I think the minimum is six months. So, but the problem then arose obviously when if you had more than, than that one plant. So we saw a lot of cases um, and, and anomalies um, and some pretty draconian um, sentencing. So, uh, you know, as, as obviously as an NGO, NGO and the community, we started to press harder as much as we could um, within the government. We were very obviously lucky to find um, sort of an actual secretariat that was um, formed, uh, which is in charge of reforms. And that parliamentary secretary was very welcoming. Her name is Roseanne, Roseanne Kutaya. Um, so we, we managed to work well with her and I, I get our ideas across of um, how we could move forward. Um, and it, it seems, you know, uh, finally it's taken a while because obviously there's a lot of opposition and she she had to get this white paper past the cabinet at the end of the day. So um, it's not an easy feat. Um, but we, you know, we, we see in this white paper some very b bold moves, you know, especially the concession of, of um, growing your own cannabis. And the most important, of course, was um, the, the expungement of criminal records. It's something we had pushed on from the very beginning, and we were very happy to see that in, um, uh, included as well. Yeah, before we had before we started this conversation, I was just reviewing articles from the Maltese press, and I saw a, a case which illustrates your point about the draconian drug laws very well. This Englishman called Daniel Holmes, who was uh, uh, who is sitting in prison for has been sitting in prison since two thousand six. If I if I'm not anymore. Sorry, no, not anymore. He was then released what? from prison. Oh, yes. yes. So, but but. Could you use these kind of cases in 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 advocacy for 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 you know, changing the public attitudes on 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 this on the drug laws? I, th I think um, the Daniel Co the, sorry Cyrus, but I think okay, the Daniel Holds um, case was uh, quite a spark in the in the whole movement. Um, I remember actually uh, meeting Cyrus uh, because I was one of the organizers of uh, a march that we had done in in, in the capital. Um, about his uh, his sentencing, and and Cyrus had come and walked along with us that day. So that's that's how far back we go, um, in trying to push this reform. So yes, there are other cases, of course, that happen that don't get picked up by the media, um, but we've seen some other ones. You know, the, the couple that was smoking a joint on 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 Valentine's Day that got dragged out of the hotel room and and taken for interrogation. So yes, there are, there are quite a few um, draconian measures, unfortunately, still happening. The good thing is that I think since then, uh, if, if we remember what happened during the, the march, the protest that was organized by Andrew and, and the group of people that were uh, in favor or at least against um, the imprisonment of Daniel Holmes. Uh, back then, I was, I believe I was the only politician to be present for that march. But I think if we had to hold that kind of protest today, we will see a number of other uh, decision makers who would actually join us today to march in favor of not putting people like Daniel Holmes in prison. So I think we have moved forward a lot since then, which is a good thing. Uh, the fact that we have had the white paper up for discussion is an excellent step. Um, all of us have made a huge effort to uh, submit the best of proposals to government. And now we hope that in the coming weeks and months, we'll see the outcome of that in a bill that will be uh, proposed to our national parliament, which comes out of the um, what people have um, recommended in their submissions to government. So, so it's a good thing that um, there is like this wave uh, in favor of um, decriminalizing and legalizing, hopefully, cannabis use. Yeah, today I just read an um, editorial in the Times of Malta in support of uh, cannabis reform. Um, how is the public uh, public uh, opinion on, on this issue in Malta? Do you have any polls which uh, measured public opinion on, on this subject? The last polls we had were um, qu quite a, um, a few years ago. I think it was or maybe two or three years ago. And it was, um, I think it was 66% of people were against um, legalization um, of cannabis. But I think um, since then, uh, a lot of things have changed. Um, I'm seeing um, more politicians coming on board, um, 
uh, obviously this government seems to be you know wanting to make um, serious reform so um, I think no no real politicians have come out against decriminalization per se but when it comes to legalization then you know they they they're a bit weary of it yeah and uh, it's interesting because one of the latest polls I had seen uh, which was on the newspaper Malta today wasn't actually a poll but it asked um, people, uh, whether they had ever used cannabis or not. And it was interesting to see that nearly 10% of the adult population said that they had at least used cannabis once. Uh, now, obviously, uh, it was still a bit of a taboo. We're speaking about, uh, we're speaking of this happening uh, two years ago. So many people would probably um, decide not to divulge what they have actually done or not. So it is believed that the numbers are, are quite higher. Um, and I think there's a shift in public opinion as well. Um, the fact that political parties and members from all political parties, at least there are a few from each and every political party, um, speaking uh, in favor of this means that public opinion is being swayed. And there's more information because I believe that for a long time, the biggest um, platform was given uh, to those who scaremonger, who scaremonger on everything, on every kind of civil right and liberty uh, and on drugs as well. So we have heard for a number of years uh, on the war against drugs, etc., which obviously has failed, not only in Malta, but all across the world. And now we're seeing a, a shift in, in the fact that a number of people are coming out with facts. They're speaking uh, with facts in their hands. And there's more of a, uh, let's say, an intelligent discussion uh, rather than scaremongering. And I believe that that intelligent discussion propelled by the Labour Party is leading towards uh, a more a more informative, a more informed society. And a more informed society obviously would change its opinion when it comes to, uh, to cannabis, but to all drugs, I believe. Did the other political parties come up with their own proposals on uh, on the government's call consultation call? Um, the main opposition party hasn't, uh, I believe. Andrew can can correct me on this, but I believe that they haven't. They said that they have their opinions, but um, they have not um, released them through the government recommendation system through the consultation. The small parties and the other small parties, I believe, are in favor of decriminalization. Okay. Um, recently, a, a company called Zenabis received a license from Malta to grow cannabis, uh, as far as I know, for export as well. So uh, can you talk a bit about how medical, the medical use of cannabis is regulated uh, in Malta? Andrew or, or myself? Uh, well, I can just, all I can say definitely is that they won't be growing any cannabis in Malta. Most of these companies that have set up here are going to be in, in, in importing the products and processing um, to export to Europe. Um, mainly, but obviously well, they have to come out and they have to apply um, through um, through Malta Enterprise and and to see if they're going to get accepted. But there's there's quite a lot of hurdles because obviously we're talking about medicine here, you know. Uh, so when these people set up their companies here, they have to go through all sorts of tests and hurdles and uh, EU GMP um, standards. So there are, as far I, I think, there are about twenty com companies that have. A memorandum of understandings, but I think it's two or three that have actually got the EU GMP at the moment. Hmm. Apart from that, I, I have met a number of um, entrepreneurs, Maltese entrepreneurs themselves, who are um, trying to venture into this uh, market. Um, they believe that um, we have, as a country, one of the best tax systems when it comes to um, uh, this area. Uh, and apart from that, uh, climate-wise, oh, I'm not a, 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 an expert uh, on growing plants, but apparently uh, it is a very good place to do so. Uh, and therefore, they're looking forward towards being able to invest 
um, into these markets in our own country. So I think it's a it's a good thing. I hope and will be continuing to push for having um, less bureaucracy when it comes to uh, to this. Yes, it is medicinal. Um, so obviously, when it comes to medicine, uh, there are a number of standards that need to be uh, kept in place. Um, but let's see that uh, we have a system that actually welcomes investors to to grow in this such such a growing market. Actually, the video you are watching now is produced by the Rights Reporter Foundation, a non-profit organization which is not supported by any governments or political parties. If you like this show, please support our work on our website, dragreporter.net. Make a donation today and become our supporting member. It makes a difference. Thank you. So the, the white paper of the government uh, would like to decriminalize uh, cannabis uh, use or possession for personal use. Uh, but it would, as I understand it, it would not uh, fully legalize the market. So there is, I see there is some differences here in the Labour Party position and the government position. Do I uh, see it correctly? Yes, you do. I mean, because the Labour Party per se is not the actual government, you know. Um, so the Labour Party is... is um, I can can say sort of uh, propose what it likes. Um, it's free to, to to speak its mind. So their their propose their actually their um, reaction or their suggestion to the white paper um, was was very valid. You know, obviously there was a part in it where they mentioned that they, we should go um, on to full control and regulation, which makes complete sense. But the press the press just picked that up. You know, that one line and and said Labour Party want legalization. So kind of it kind of blew out um of proportion because even when i read that headline i was like okay hang on a minute here what's going on then i i had to read the actual their actual suggestion their actual report and it was um it, it was a very good one uh, obviously the the the, um, the government uh, in malta currently is made up of only one party which is the labor party um the good thing is that while government proposed its white paper uh, we had an internal discussion within our own party and we came up with um, our, our suggestions to um, to the government's white paper and as a party we are pushing the government to go further than it was originally planning in the in the white paper and and i'm sure that uh, the group of us who were working on this within the party and within the national executive of the party, um, now that we have a mandate uh, by the executive, since this was voted by all the national through the national executive, um, and we have this mandate, we will definitely be pushing as a party uh, internally uh, and externally to make sure that uh, government, as much as possible, um, falls in line with with what the party is currently uh, proposing. Obviously, it is important to listen to everyone, to also listen to those who have a number of concerns. Um, some concerns may be valid, maybe uh, at, at face value, especially, and it's good to to hear them out. It's good to, it's good to discuss with such people uh, as well um, why they have their concerns and try to debate with them and discuss with them uh, realities with facts, because at the end of the day, as I started in the beginning, it is facts and scientific evidence that is mostly important when discussing such issues. And uh, I look forward to see uh, a good a uh, bill presented to Parliament, which then could also be uh, further um, ameliorated within uh, the context of our parliamentary system as well. So you, you mentioned the opposition to the reforms. Where does the strongest opposition comes from? Is it, is it coming from the police or is it coming from opposition parties or any like the church organizations or who are those who are opposing this bill? Uh, mainly, mainly yes, church church organisations of which Caritas is one of them. They are the main drug rehabilitation um, centre. Yeah. There are others as well, but they are also obviously um, questioning this move. Um, they do o o obviously start off by saying they agree with um, the fact that people should not be criminalised, but and then they would question why we are not criminalising them for more than seven grams, for example. Because seven grams is what is being decriminalized for possession. That is, um, so it, it's sometimes they they say one thing and then they they mean another. Um, obviously, there are then the conservative. The doctors are are usually very conservative as, as well. 
and um, they they together um, signed the joint statement um, or warning basically of the consequences of what could happen. Um, but then we did we did see another group of um, sort of higher higher up um, medical professionals like um, surgeons and um, other people of that level, which all signed the joint statement saying that they they agreed with um, decriminalization. And again, they just went on to warn about uh, the effects of cannabis. So I think really, in general, we should see a pretty strong bill come out of this. As I see it now in Europe, it is increasingly the question is not only you know legalized or not legalized, but but how to regulate the market. And there are many debates on on this. Uh, and uh, in Europe, there are many activists who uh, who are against the the commercialized model, which is in North America, and uh, and they favor. Uh, 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 a model which is less based less on on the monopol monopolization of, of big companies, but rather uh, like as you mentioned, Cyrus cannabis social clubs uh, model. So, is there this is, is is this debate going on in Malta? And what is your your position on on this debate? Um, I, I think the debate is going on uh, in Malta with regards to this, but uh, I, I think most people are simply first waiting to see uh, what whether we're going to just decriminalize or legalize as well before going into the details. But I think that the details are important uh, already uh, from this point in time, because um, if we're going to um, legislate in favor of legalizing, I believe that from the start we should um, at least have a direction where where we want to head to. I personally uh, am more in favor of the social cannabis social club um, kind of model. Uh, I do not necessarily like what happened in North America and Canada, um, where big pharmaceutical companies ended up monopolizing the whole um, market. Let's say uh, I'm more keen to see. Um, individual users being able to um, grow their own product and when they can't grow their own product because of um, the apartments they live in or various other factors, uh, I would like to see um, the pooling of uh, resources together between uh, users who would then be able to pool not only the resources, but also pool in uh, the product, the, the take uh, the product uh, together from what they would have pooled. So that is my my uh, opinion. I am for um, a more, um, let's say, social um, aspect of legalization rather than the commercial. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, we're, we've pretty much released our proposal to the government back in as relief back in 2019, um, and we had proposed um, social clubs as well. Um, we uh, had got a lot of our information from people that work in Spain, from um, from ICS and NCOD, um, and we had um, suggested that uh, um, a social club model would be the best to keep it at a com community and grassroots level. Um, obviously, we. You know the the market is I, I feel already sort of um, swaying some maybe even politicians decisions in, in the way they're coming out of, about this white paper so we have to be very careful we have to be very vigilant um, to make sure that this um, at least the, the groundwork is done so we can build a solid a solid base um, to where people can share and people have a safe space to go and people can can grow their own before the inevitable happens, I guess. Um, it's probably going to happen all around Europe, but I, I, I can see that the market will, will probably be, um, you know, not, not very forgiving. Mm. We, can, we can say that uh, in Malta, the cannabis reform is not driven by the lobbies of big companies, right? Correct. Um, definitely, mm. it, it, it says so. You can You can see that through this white paper. Um, but obviously, you never know what's going to happen in, in the near the near future because um, things can change pretty quickly. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Cyrus, as as a member of the European Parliament, uh, you have uh, some oversight of, of the Euro of Europe, European situation, uh, and uh, you initiated a conference not so long time ago on on, on cannabis reform in Europe. So, what were your uh, what, what were the lessons learned from, from the conference you organized and how do you see the situation in the European level? 
Yeah, unfortunately, so far, even here in the European Parliament, there isn't much debate and discussion on cannabis for personal or recreational use. Uh, unfortunately, most of this discussion revolves around medicinal cannabis, uh, which obviously is an important topic in itself, but uh, there are other realities that must be addressed. So uh, as a team, as my office, uh, together with my advisor, Pia Mikalev, we decided to um, hold this first conference ever in the European Parliament to discuss uh, cannabis for personal use. It was interesting because uh, we wanted to have a number of speakers who are members of the European Parliament also to get uh, support from others. And while we know that there are a number of other members of the European Parliament who support uh, this cause, it was very difficult to, to get uh, politicians to speak up on this because uh, many tend to prefer uh, to take a back seat when it comes to this issue to see where this will be going and then maybe um, discuss this topic at a, at a later stage. That said, we found a, a number of allies, which was uh, interesting. So uh, the first thing that I have learned from this is how important it is to break the taboo when it comes to uh, cannabis use also here uh, in the European Parliament. And we will be working with uh, a few other members uh, in order to do that in the coming um, months. But apart from that, um, I think what came out strongly is um, the fact that we should work towards having um, obviously decriminalization, legalization, but uh, we should do this um, from uh, have a social aspect, uh, a social perspective to this. Um, obviously, the majority of speakers also coming from the European Parliament were more uh, politicians coming from the left. So it is uh, the first instinct, let's say, for politicians coming from the left to be more in favor of a social aspect. Uh, but when you also see the different um, speakers that we had during the conference coming from all across the European Union and beyond in reality, and people who are involved in this field, um, the, I think that the major takeout was um, the importance of keeping in mind that social aspect. Whilst it is important, obviously, to see economies grow uh, and have uh, economic growth all across the European Union, especially post-pandemic, uh, it is a reality that in this case, we must learn from the lessons uh, when it comes to other medicinals, for instance, where we have big pharma that has taken over and unfortunately is affecting uh, a number of patients, or in this case would be users negatively. So um, the big takeout, I believe, was um, to work towards uh, the social cannabis social clubs structure, like there is, for instance, in Uruguay uh, or Spain, and what we had here in Belgium before which unfortunately is not existent any longer. It sounds like you, you have been working on this issue for a long time, so you didn't start it yesterday. Uh, so it's a question to both of you. What would you recommend to activists and politicians in other countries which are not so much progressed in, in this regard? So can you share some uh, uh, some experiences with them or some recommendations with them, like of something you learned uh, through these years? What works, what doesn't work? Don't try this, don't try that. Look, I think I think as an as an activist, you're at a sort of certain level where you might not be getting any cooperation. So your only route is to, um, you know, write a lot in in uh, in in the content section or to to take to the streets, you know. But um, if you have some politicians that are actually um, sort of in favor of the idea of reform, and you can create a direct line with those politicians, then you can start. Um, converting into more advocacy work, you know, um, trying to show them what what road to take, um, and 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 always base everything on human rights. Um, I think that way they they seem to see the to see the picture, although they're oblivious to what is going on. When you explain to them the human rights impact um, it has on people that consume cannabis and and grow cannabis, they seem to to get the idea. So yeah, try and find someone um, in government and, and try and keep a direct line. That's that, that's the, what that's what we did. So um, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, from my end, um, I consider myself as an activist. I mean, I am a 
politician. I am a member of, of the European Parliament. However, uh, my background is that of working in NGOs on human rights and civil liberties. So um, that is what I, that is the thing that I know uh, what to and how to do in reality, because uh, I do not consider myself as a politician, but rather as an activist who has now been given a political role. So um, I believe that uh, the important thing is believing that uh, whatever you are uh, saying and advocating for at the end of the day can change uh, laws, can change mentalities, but more than that, it can change lives. And I think we should never shy away from voicing out our opinions, even when it is, uh, we might think that we're the only ones who believe that um, this thing is true or the other thing is true. Uh, we should simply um, stand up and, and speak out. Uh, and at the end of the day, we'll start realizing that there are a number of other people who agree with us. And that starts a movement towards um, achieving that purpose that you would have. We have done this. Uh, back home when it comes to basic civil right, uh, civil rights like divorce, for instance, which we didn't have till 10 years ago. We did the same when it came to LGBTIQ rights. We started this eight years ago. And what has become from zero to hero when it comes to LGBTIQ rights being the best country in the European Union on that. And I think that now this is the next, uh, this is the next battle, let's say, uh, that we have. The more we speak about it, the more we show facts on the issue, um, the more that people become more informed and the more they become in favor of what we're um, speaking of. At the end of the day, as Andrew said, it all revolves around human rights and human rights are fundamental, they're universal, they should be there for everyone and there shouldn't be discrimination when it comes to, to human rights. Thank you. It's definitely very inspiring to see that in a country with, with this, you know, social conservative traditions, change is possible and it is happening. So, uh, what is the timeline of, of cannabis reform now? So, what will what will be the next steps? What what do you expect uh, will happen in the next uh, few years? From from my end, um, I believe that currently government is going through the. Um, the different recommendations that it has received through the consultation procedure um, and will, as soon as it's done from that, it will come up with a proposed bill. Obviously, what doesn't help is the fact that um, the current government's term is soon over. Uh, so at the beginning of next year, um, we should be having um, national elections uh, again. Uh, so I hope that... Um, we will have a bill before that. Um, if not, I believe it would be one of the first things that the new government would do. Uh, but I, I'd rather, I, I don't want to see this as a political, um, you know, a, a political partisan issue. Uh, it should be a human rights issue. And I'm afraid that with an election coming up, it will end up becoming a partisan issue, which shouldn't be. Because at the end of the day, as I said, it is all about facts and we should uh, rely on scientific evidence rather than have a partisan partisan bickering between one party and another on such on such issues andrew are you optimist i think look to be honest um, we're hoping we are hoping that this bill actually goes through before the summer recess um, because obviously we want to grow this summer, <laughs> but uh, uh, there also is, um, like Cyrus said, an, um, a, an election coming up. Uh, so we're hoping that once this bill goes through, we'll have something proposed actually by the government in one of its electoral promises about how it is going to control and regulate the cannabis market in Malta. Cyrus, Andrew, thank you so much for being with us today here. Uh, and I hope next time we will uh, we will have you in Drug Reporter Cafe. We can discuss the details of, of cannabis regulation in Malta. Good luck to uh, your work. And, uh, and thank you so much for those who are watching us on Facebook. Uh, please follow us on social media. And please don't forget that uh, Drug Reporter Cafe is operated by an NGO. So please support us. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.